Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last days. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And they will all be taught by God. And so it is that Jesus tonight has revealed to you the delightful gifts of the gospel. He's described, actually, the relationship of God the Father, Son, and implied the Spirit. He's talked about uh, the work of salvation and where salvation is to be found and how one is brought to faith, all wrapped up in a teaching about a a miracle, but one that seemed to have to do with bread. And the people get hung up on the bread and they miss the gospel that's being preached to them. As it is often with especially children. Each day we read through the stories at home and invariably one of the smaller children will get hung up on one thing. We had the feeding of the 4,000 today. We read it yesterday because I'm here at church on Wednesday nights. I can't read it with them. And uh, it was really hung up on one detail. I think it was, why were there so many people? Or seven loaves? Or, and then there were baskets full. How'd that happen? Right? And then you lose sight of maybe the bigger teaching. So it was for these, this was the feeding of the 5,000. They were caught up in the one statement about the bread. I am the bread that came down from heaven. Jesus confesses that he is their manna. He is their bread indeed. Or, as we sing in the hymn, he is our meat and drink indeed, referring to the Lord's Supper. Now this is a hard teaching, and it is going to get harder for them. You'll hear that next week. Jesus will finally double down on that bread from heaven to the point where, well, as we heard at the very end, the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. And wait till you hear what he has to say about the blood. So, Jesus' teaching often gets lost when we get hung up on a particular detail. What is that expression? Um, Losing the forest for the trees or the trees for the forest? I don't know. Which way? Losing the forest for the trees, right? Yeah. All right. So they miss the bigger picture because they're so focused on this one little detail. And that bigger picture, as I said, is the preaching of the gospel. You will be taught by God and receive eternal life. How much better could it be? After all of his teaching, the right question is to say, well, how do I receive this good news? How do I receive this life and salvation? Do you mean to tell me, Jesus, that everything you've promised is in you? And you are my bread then? And of course, that's the answer. Yes. That's where the teaching is meant to be led. But sometimes our hearts are so stubborn and our eyes so blind that we miss what's right in front of us. So we must be taught by God. And that's why he sends us a preacher. So we'll do it. First, as he says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And there he's already foretelling of the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. When we will uh, rejoice at the wedding feast of the Lamb that has no end. With rich food, day after day, and well-aged wine, well-refined, he says, or Isaiah says. And so, whoever comes to Jesus will definitely not hunger and will never thirst in the resurrection. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And that's the really sticky point, isn't it? One of the hardest things about this sermon from Jesus is that he talks about the gospel. He describes the gospel. He describes his relationship to the Father and the Son. He describes how he is bred from heaven. He describes about that whoever believes will have eternal life. But he leaves out the important detail. How is it that I'm going to believe? Or how is it that you will believe, because faith is the key word. 
And so throughout the whole sermon, he actually wants us to, to, he begs that question, he wants us to ask, because he keeps saying words like this, whoever comes to me, or everyone who looks to the Son or believes in him, whoever, everyone, well, who is that? Is that me? And that's the important question. So he tells us actually, or he implies, that this work is going to be accomplished through the preaching of the word as you are taught by God. And the key Im implication that was left out, but he will further expand upon for his disciples finally, is in, on the night that he was betrayed in that upper room discourse when he reveals to them the work of the Holy Spirit. Now the Spirit will begin, be sent to them to testify of him, to actually draw all people to Jesus. So it is the Spirit who's absent from this sermon, but later is revealed to be the means by which God uses, the Spirit uses the Word, I should say, as his means to draw you to Jesus. And all that the Father gives me will come to me. How's that for a promise? Because you have been called and elected by God, he will gather you into his church and he will here give you his gifts, the gifts not just for this life, but especially the gifts that bring eternal life. And whoever comes to me, and you know that's you, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, teaching and revealing about the relationship of the Father to the Son, and again by implication the Spirit, that the Son can do nothing that the Father has not given him to do. They have one will. So when we confess that there are not three gods, but one God, that's part of that confession. That the Father and the Son and the Spirit are not operating independently of each other, doing they may be doing different things, but they're all operating together with one will, namely, that you would come to faith in Christ, that you'd be forgiven of all your sins, and that you'd be given resurrection on the last day, as he said. That's the will of the Father, that no one would be lost and that all would come to his Son. This is the will of him who sent me the Father, that I should lose nothing of all that has been given to me, and, but raise it up on the last day. And again, whoever looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is kind of surprising that they get hung up on this bread from heaven bit, and they're not hung up on the resurrection of the body <laughs> to be raised up on the last day in himself. And I think it's because they don't believe that God would come down from heaven to them. The natural religion of man, and the reason why they get hung up on the bread, is not that God would come down to them and serve them and give them eternal life, but rather that they would need to ascend to God, go up the mountain, so to speak, and there, or build a tower to God, if you prefer, and get as close to God as possible, and then God would probably you know, assume them even further than into the heavenly dwellings. This is the natural religion of man. This is in every world religion apart from faithful Christianity. All the other religions are about aspiring to be more and more like the gods, or God. And it's certainly, as we heard from the epistle, God does bring us out of our former way of life into a new life. But again, that is his work too, by the work of the word and the spirit working through that word. The spirit who dwells in you by faith, the spirit given to you in your, whole, in your baptism will make and renew your life. Your ascent to heaven is not your work either. It's actually utterly dependent upon God's descent to earth, namely in his son Jesus, to suffer and to die, to descend into the depths of the earth and death, and finally into hell, and then to free you from death's grasp and the resurrection of the body. So God comes down to you, and that's the, really the hang-up. It's not just about Jesus being bread, although that will be one, an issue for them too, we'll hear next week, but it's that he comes down from, he comes down to us. He dwells amongst us. We mere mortals and sinners, God takes on human flesh, Christ, true man and true God, in one person. That's a stumbling block. That's difficult to believe by reason, 
but now it's revealed to you for faith. And that by believing in the Son and looking on him, you will have eternal life, or you should anyway, and be raised up on the last day. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. So, how is it that you know that you are, are one of the whoever's or everyone's? <laughs> well, it's the fact that Jesus has gathered you tonight by his Spirit here to this place to hear this word, to be taught by God, namely of who Jesus is and what he has come to do for you. And he calls even this preaching of the word bread from heaven. But how is he going to raise you on the last day? By forgiving you your sins. The suffering and death that, that overcame death and absolves for sin once and for all is washed upon you in baptism. It's proclaimed to you again in the absolution that you heard. Now in this sermon, it's fed to you again like bread. And of course, where there is the body and blood of Christ, there is not only forgiveness, but as we confess, life and salvation. So when you go to the sacrament, you actually go to your eternal life already, receiving, well, literal bread, <laughs> wafers, but actually true bread, that's Jesus. Because you receive his body and blood, you receive his flesh, the bread from heaven, both in word and forgiveness, then you can be assured that the words that are about the gospel, which he proclaimed to them that they are scandalized by, are actually the gospel for you. For you, for the forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation. Thanks be to Jesus in his holy name. Amen. Amen.